Hello, my name is Dr. Georgi Sabo. I serve as the Dean of Graduate Studies at Ubiquiti University and the Wisdom School. And this is the last trimester, the third trimester of the 2020 Gradebook course. I'm aware that some of you attended our summer courses and the last two sessions of the Great Books course. All of these webinars centered on the theme of the true nature of the feminine power. Across these courses, we investigated the ageless wisdom, intuition, creativity, and we are going to follow this theme by discussing Clarissa Pinkola Estes' book, The Women Who Run With the Wolves. This is a true lexicon for the female psyche. It talks about the inner lives of women. Also, it introduces us, the wild woman archetype. And this is what she said. The wild woman is the health of all women. Without her, women's psychology makes no sense. This wilder woman is the prototypical woman. No matter what culture, no matter what era, no matter what politic, she does not change. Her cycles change. Her symbolic representations change. But in essence, she does not change. She is what she is, and she is whole. Well, I wish I read this book when I was a teenager. But nevertheless, throughout the years, I reread this book. And every single time I read it, I find myself in every single story, and more to the point, the analysis of Pinkola as this. There's a true profound wisdom in storytelling, and I believe that this is one of the best stories compilation of humankind. And I really hope that one day this book will be part of the curriculum of elementary, high school, and universities alike. Now I would like to pass the word on from one wild woman to another one, Brenda Crowther. I know that some of you know her already and her work. She gave us a wonderful four sessions course this January on Carl Gustav Jung's Red Book. If for whatever reason you missed this amazing course, you can still access it through our website in the archive course offerings. Those who do not know Brenda, she's a Jungian analyst, a death psychologist, an artist, one of the best dream translator. She's an international presenter. She gives, she gives talks and leads workshops in the UK, in Europe, and in Switzerland. Now, over to you, dear Brenda. Well, good evening, everyone, and greetings wherever you are. And welcome to these two presentations on women who run with the wolves. I just want uh, Rip to put up the first slide and show us something of what Clarissa Pinkola Estes speaks about. Now, if you look at this, you'll see right in the bottom right-hand corner, a tiny, tiny little car and a tiny figure of a man. And what do we see in the middle? We see a great instinctive force driving its way up with fire. So that gives you a clue of what the instinctive force is. Thank you, Rick. We can go back to the big screen now. So first, I'd like to introduce these two presentations and naturally some of my own relationship to this book for to speak about women who run with the wolves. One must really, really have a relationship to it. It has a really distinguishing quality. It's written with great intelligence 
and it has its scholarly backup with references index, but with this great intelligence, it is not an intellectual book. When it first came out, it influenced my choice of profession. That is to train as a Jungian analyst. It fired my imagination. It tapped into aspects of the feminine that I was out of touch with. But I recognized that out of touchness. And some deep, wild secrets spoke to me that I had in the past rejected, but unconsciously. I was convinced emotionally that the book was truthful, but my intellect wandered off now and then with its own agenda. Why was that? I think it was simply that I was unconsciously conditioned by the society that I lived in. I wasn't aware of it, if only I had been. I was convinced that it was really serious. So when something touched me and I pushed it away unknowingly, what remained was a heart recognition of it. These things are very subtle. It didn't mean that the book went away because I gave it a little push. It sat there and waited like a cat at the mouse hole. That is, I had heard it. And you'll notice that I say heard it, not read it, for the book has a voice. In this way, women who run with the wolves penetrated that conditioned lair and inspired me over many years to strip more and more things away. I became interested in not just becoming a person, but becoming an authentic woman. Trying to reach beyond the standard of the academic woman, which could have been my alternative fate. I'd watch many women, though not all, make that sacrifice of wildness to fit in and to earn a living. I too made that sacrifice, but not too deeply. That great feminine wolf goddess. of that invisible wolf skin that I needed to reclaim and manifest. Inkola Estes is a Jungian analyst and put many years into researching and expressing wild nature in women who run with the wolves. And she began with the study of wild animals. That is, she began with the instincts. Animals always express the truth of what they instinctively are and cannot deviate. This was a fine way to begin. Can we be so authentic? Yet I found during my Jungian studies that this great book was not required reading. Many books, less profound and with a certain dryness posing as professional clinical approaches were on the reading lists of my training in UK. I found the wildness I unconsciously sought in the Jungian training in Switzerland, which took place in the midst of a mountain setting high up in a retreat center on the snow line, where the street lights didn't reach and where the constellations were visible at night. It was a small wilderness where I could wander in the dark between worlds and where strange things did happen. For though the mountains are earthy places, they are often eerie and point to the celestial. Now, Clarissa Pinkola Estes was a former executive director of the C.G. Jung Center in the US. So the book has touched American Jungians Yet, if we look at the praises before the book starts, which you get in any bestseller, not one Jungian analyst has made a comment. And yet Jung himself was really a wild man, even a shaman, for who but a shaman could have written the Red Book? It seems that the 
wilder aspects of the woman's soul had somehow been passed over. Perhaps the text did not conform to certain academic or patriarchal traditions, or was it considered subversive? Now, that would have pleased me. But then I thought, well, analysts are exemplars, par excellence of the study of the psyche, of the very souls of men and women, of the web of the universe that lives within men and women. Could it be that because our society is patriarchal dominant, we simply didn't notice? Like the conditioning I've described myself in myself. Of course, it hasn't always been so. There was a great Mediterranean feminine civilization. The awareness of this was deepened by the studies of a Lithuanian woman called Maria Gimbutas. She revealed this great and enduring era. Gimbutas was an archaeologist and anthropologist and studied the early Neolithic and Bronze Age culture of old Europe. The Neolithic is about 12,000 years ago and the Bronze Age ended 3,200 BC. So with considerable proof, linguistic and archaeological, this is her thesis. She traced a woman-centered culture, which she called gynocentric. In this earlier and more peaceful civilization, women were honored and espoused economic equality. Then the male dominated Kurgan peoples, a race of Indo-Europeans invaded old Europe and brought with them a warrior culture. This civilization was imposed on old Europe and the hierarchical rule of the warrior supplanted the woman-centered culture. This work of Gimbutas, Maria Gimbutas, along with her colleague, Joseph Campbell, who you will probably be very familiar with because he's a storyteller of great gifts. The, her research is housed with his in the Archive and Research Center at Pacifica University. You might ask, what is that to do with Clarissa Pinkola Estes and her book? A lot. No woman creates in isolation, but works with their individual gifts to generate a network of creative filaments, a silvery web. It is no wonder that the universe is often likened to an enormous cosmic web. Think of the net of Indra, that Hindu cosmological image. At every junction of the net is a jewel. And this jewel reflects into every other jewel at every other junction of the net until the net becomes invisible and all you see is an emanation of ineffable reflected light. We too have to find our place in that net, in that web. In this respect too, we only have to think of the great contribution of Anne Baring and her fine and deep research into the expression of the feminine. So I've spoken about three different women. So this is an individual effort. Across the world, the feminine plugs into different yet specific gifts and talents. The thing that Pinkola Estes contributes is something we have lost touch with. And that's the lost instinctive quality of women that needs a stronger place in the shining net of jewels. So returning to Maria Gimbutas, she was Lithuanian and both parents were lovers of Lithuanian folk art. Musicians, poets, writers and storytellers were in their homes all the time. 
And Lithuania too is full of lakes, heavily forested, mostly agricultural land. And we don't have to look far to find this parallel in Pincola Estes. She came of a Mexican Spanish bloodline, later adopted, as she describes, by a family of fiery Hungarians. And of course, one of those introduced me tonight. She was surrounded, Pincala Estes, by woodlands, orchards, farmland near the Great Lakes. She is a keeper of the old stories. A cantadora, as she describes this truly important task. I think of her as one of the cosmic web's caretakers of the feminine mysteries in the form of the instinct. Then we could ask, as a woman who is connected to this book, how am I connected to the three women that I admire? I too was born in a remote and beautiful region of the north of England, where the constellations could be seen at night with vast stretches of moorland and fast running streams, which in those days of greater freedom, I was able to roam at will and without fear. My mother connected me to the art of storytelling. In this remote region with no electricity, so no radio, no television, my mother told us stories through the long dark nights of winter. In this most mysterious atmosphere of firelight and candlelight, this was a place between worlds. I guess my mother was a hidden wild woman, even though she perceived herself as absolutely respectable. My education too left me with a civilized veneer, which began to dissolve after I had begun to read women who run with the wolves. So this first talk then looks at what the wild woman might look like and feel like in our lives. And to support this, we listen to a storytelling, a way into the invisible world. And then we look at the symbolic content. The second, the second talk, which is on the 13th of October, looks at the oppositions against women who run with the wolves and how they may even come from women, how subtle they are and how that is changing with the work of each individual woman. For we cannot work en masse there is no general paradigm. It has such a marvelous title. And so let's hope to go into that wolf world of the feminine. As a further note, please be aware that when I use the word female, I mean the human woman. When I use the word feminine, this is generally in the cosmic sense and includes the feminine soul of the male, of the man as well. So presentation one is Finding Wolf Woman. Now very early in the book, Clinco Cl Clarissa Pincola Estes describes the disguised wildness of the woman through her own experience. And this is a quote, she says, like so many women before and after me, I live my life as a disguised creatura, a creature. Like my kith and kin before me, I swaggered in high heels and I wore a dress and hat to church. But my fabulous tail often fell below my hemline and my ears twitched until my hat pitched at the very least down over both eyes and sometimes clear across the room. I've not forgotten the song of those dark years 
Ambre del Alma, the song of the starved soul. But neither have I forgotten the joyous canto hondo, the deep song, the words of which come back to us when we do the work of soulful reclamation. This instinctive and glorious tale showed beneath my mother's hemline too, and is a wonderful metaphor for what lives in all women, and is being covered over by a respectable and ladylike frock. It brings to mind an experience after a particularly boring, pedantic lecture, where emotion, feeling and instinct were completely absent. I said to a woman, a friend who was sitting next to me, Shall we take our coffee outside and swish our saurian tails? This arid lecture brought up that reptilian saurian irritation that notes the missing instinct. The speciality par excellence. The missing instinct that Pinkola Estes speaks of. She tells us this story about La Loba, the wolf woman. The wolf woman of the deep soul, which gives us the thread of the whole book and how all our tales come into being. So let's now hear the tale of La Loba. There is an old woman who lives in a hidden place. Everyone knows about this in their souls, but few have seen her. She waits for wanderers and seekers who stumble across her place, or perhaps even follow her scent. She's circumspect, often hairy, always fat, and avoids company. She is a crower and a cackler, and makes sounds more animal than human. She's often seen traveling towards old Mexico in a burnt out car with the back window shot out. Or maybe she's standing by the highway near El Paso or riding shotgun with truckers or even walking to market with strangely shaped firewood on her back. She calls herself by many names, the bone woman the gatherer, but most of all, wolf woman, La Loba. Her sole work is collecting and preserving bones, which are in danger of being lost to the world. Her cave is filled with bones of all manner of desert creatures, the deer, the rattlesnake, the crow, but her real speciality is wolf. She creeps and crawls through the mountains and fiddles about in the soils and looks in river beds, looking for wolf bones. And when she has established an entire skeleton, when all the bones are in their place and the beautiful white sculpture is laid out in front of her, she sits by the fire and thinks, what song shall I sing? When she's sure, she stands over the creatura, raises her arms above it and sings, sings out. Then the rib bones and the leg bones begin to flesh out. And then the creature becomes furred. La Loba sinks some more and the creature slowly comes into being. And guess what? Its tail curls upwards, shaggy and strong. She sinks some more. The creature starts to breathe. And still La Loba sings until the floor of the desert shakes 
Then the wolf opens its eyes and runs off down the canyon. Somewhere in the running, by way of the speed, or the splashing through with river, or by way of sunlight or even moonlight, the wolf, the wolf is suddenly transformed into a laughing woman who runs free towards the horizon. So, this is what you must remember. If you wander in the desert around sundown and you're feeling very weary and very lost, you're lucky. Because it is at that moment that the walls between the worlds are thin. When your consciousness has lost its fire of attention and its decisive power, then La Loba may approach you, take a liking to you, and show you something of your own soul. So Pinkola Estes describes the telling of La Loba as a miracle story, a resurrection story, and it truly is, about the underworld connection to Wild Woman. This story has its own medicine and magic. If you learn it by heart and speak it aloud, don't read it quietly to yourself and then analyze it against consciously acquired knowledge, but hear your own soul voice and its vibrations coming back to you. Then the relationship to Wild Woman begins. Pinkola Estes has this to say about psychoanalysis, which is related to this. She says, you wish psychoanalytic advice? Her response, go gather bones. That's the business of dream analysis. So let's feel our way into some of the motifs of this story. She's fat and hairy, the old woman, like a bedraggled animal. Now think of all the other archetypal images, the great mother and father, the begetters of life, the divine child, the youthful fountain of life, the trickster, the sorceress and the sorcerer, the heroine, the warrior, and many, many more. How does La Loba differ? She is, as Pinkola Estes says, symbolic of the feeder root to an entire instinctive system. The archetypes, of course, are never seen, only their images, which I've just described a few of them that wolf woman, wolf woman or wild woman becomes the energetic feeding system of all archetypal images and energies. She is the net and the taproot of the cosmic images and energies. Wolf woman is the energetic motor of the universe. And what is that motor? It's divine and human love. She is often understood, La Loba, as the birthing place of God. She is as old as God, if not older, in our great mythologies. Pink Pinkola Estes describes how the woman's work of reclaiming the soul, this singing over the bones, is done, and I quote, by descending into the deepest mood of love and feeling to one's desire for relationship with the wildish self overflows. This is singing over the bones. But she has this most important comment to make. We cannot make the mistake of attempting to elicit this great feeling of love from a lover. For this women's labor of finding and singing 
the creation hymn is a solitary work, a work carried out in the desert of the psyche. We find La Loba, the wolf woman, in the space between worlds that reaches us better if we are tired, weary of life, upset by something, crying and have lost our rational handle on things. And then think of the spaces in the body. Imagine a blood vessel or vein passing through the liver. How big is the space between the organ and the blood vessel wall? Unimaginable. But there, there is Wolf Woman. She's there too. She has this capacity to enter the tiny as much as the immense. If we think of Jung's way of expressing the psyche, he speaks of the collective unconscious, or the other name is the objective psyche, where the archetypal instinctual powers reside. The energies or images from this region of the psyche emerge through dreams into the personal layer of the unconscious and there into consciousness. And there we have the capacity to remember the dream. So when we are tired, the walls between these worlds break and there is more free passage. And yet there is another faraway layer that Jung calls the psychoid unconscious. This is where the biological and the psychological worlds meet. So our soul founds, finds not only a psychological space, but the space between the vein and the liver. It is at this strange and deep level that La Loba approaches us, for she comes to us through our own biological body as much as through the soul. Sometimes the body can help us realize energies that couldn't come another way. For example, when I was in my late teens, I used to be a long distance country, uh, cross country runner. I was never good at short sprints and this also has remained as my character. At a certain point during the race, exhaustion always crept over me and it was usually just over the halfway mark. Then I just felt that I couldn't take another step. How heavy and tired my body was. But I persevered and suddenly there was a sharp rise of energy as if something had burst out of my chest and someone else ran for me and my body just followed along. At this moment, the instinctive power had risen in my psyche and taken over. When I reflect back, I think this was my youthful, rather unconscious wolf power. But I was young and could only respond in the now instinctively. At that age, I did not reason. I just followed what happened. I was in the now. Looking back with a certain amount of reflective power and some knowledge from my Jungian training, I feel that I touch this psychoid layer, bringing psyche and body together. For off I went, down the canyon, you could say, towards the finishing line. And then later I used to think, sometimes it's a pity about education. But yet we have to take on the challenge of how we integrate the two. And this is the great challenge of consciousness. For there is no paradigm, there is only individual work. But we need to be aware of the overpowering nature of the instincts. Rick, could we have the next picture please on the PowerPoint? Here we have uh, another painting about the power of the instincts. 
and you see this wild animal hovering over this tiny man who is almost helpless. This is a painting by the Swiss artist Peter Birkhäuser. So that's what we must remember about the instincts when we use our rationality. The rationality is the small figure. Thank you, Rick. So in the next story, we look at the feminine from another point of view. It's another story taken from women who run with the wolves and it's called The Four Rabinim. One night, four Rabinim were visited by an angel. This angel awakened them and carried them to the seventh vault of the seventh heaven. And there, all four beheld the wheel of Ezekiel. Somewhere in the descent from this paradise down to earth, one rabbi, having seen such splendor, lost his mind and wandered about the earth, foaming and frothing, and was lost. The second rabbi was extremely cynical about his experience. He said, oh, I, I never saw Ezekiel's wheel, I, I just dreamt it. And anyway, nothing really happened. The third rabbi carried on and on about what he'd seen, for he was totally obsessed. He lectured all over the world and would not stop trying to construct what the experience could be and what its meaning could be. In this way, he went astray and betrayed his faith. The fourth rabbi was a poet. He took a piece of paper in one hand and a reed in the other. He sat near the window quietly and he wrote song after song after song. He praised the evening dove, his daughter in the cradle and all the stars in the sky. And he lived his life better than before. So what are we seeing in this tale? Four reactions perhaps to the spiritual experience of the wheel of Ezekiel. Let's just find out what that is before we speak about it. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, we find this tremendous vision of the uh, four wheels. It's written about 571 before Christ. So if we think of the gynocentric civilization of old Europe, which ended in 3200 before Christ, this is well into the patriarchal period. But let's just hear a few words of what Ezekiel saw. It's very brief. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub and the appearance of the wheels was as the colour of a barrel stone and as for their appearances the four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel so this is a tremendous vision a great symbolic vision of the universe Jung would have called that a mandala, a vision of the self in paradise. And we have four reactions to this immensity by the four rabbinim. We see that only one has found a relationship with La Loba, which is a warning on how we must be careful on our adventures. For the first rabbi who loses his mind, the experience has overpowered him. I thought I lost you there. 
Sorry about um, that. This sometimes happens when the experience comes too early without the right preparation or it's been sought too consciously. The door of the visionary world has been pushed open through will or desire to experience it. At times, though not always, because there are many, many visionary people in the world, it's through the taking of a psychedelic drug that pushes open the door of the world. So you will notice from our first story of La Loba that she approaches us, we do not approach her. She is the one who opens the door. Our body is sensitive tissue, easily affected, and can be destroyed by a vision at the wrong time. And that's why the first rabbi goes frothing and foaming about the world, because he has lost his human connection. The second rabbi is the cynical one. He has contained his experience, this is true, but he's over-rational. A mistake of the patriarchal power position. This happens also in the story of the angel Gabriel, who comes to Zacharias in the temple in the Gospel of Luke, to say that his wife will bear a son who will be the prophet John. In the, in the miraculous presence of the angel, he behaves like the second rabbi and says, oh, she's far too old to have a child. A very casual treatment of a visitation of the angel Gabriel. He takes the superior position like the cynic. And for that, at least the angel takes notice of him, strikes him down until his son is born and his name John. That is, he learns about humility. So here again we see the lesson of La Loba, who prefers the toughness of humility to the easy assumption of power. This is very important. In the case of Zacharias, he finds the human connection back over time. The third rabbi, is affected positively by his experience, but can't stop talking about it. He lectures about it all the time and talks about the meaning of it and how the vision was constructed and so forth. And he completely loses the experiential connection. Here we see what the intellect does, spiritual experience. This man renders it aesthetic or pedantic even. Pinkola Este says about these four experiences, I quote, that some persons in their pursuit of the soul will over aestheticize a God or self experience. Some will undervalue it, some will overvalue it, and some who are not ready for it will be injured by it. But still others will find their way to what Jung called the moral obligation to live out and express what one has learnt in the descent or ascent to the wild self. So the experience of the wheel of Ezekiel is not a mental or intellectual experience. This moral obligation that Jung speaks of and which Clarissa Pinkola Estes refers to is a way of living. So we, we've been breathed upon by something. You could say we've been breathed upon by the, crea the creature that assembles the bones. If we could have the next slide, uh, Rick. So Pinkola Estes says, our work is to show we have been breathed upon. To show it, give it out, sing it out. 
to live it out in the topside world. What we have received through our sudden knowings from body, from dreams and journeys of all sorts. And here you see the blue breath, the blue light of the unconscious going straight onto a woman's face from this strange creature of the unconscious. So this is what happens when we have an experience. We are breathed upon. Thank you, Rick. And what of the fourth rabbi, the poet? He is the one who takes on the moral obligation. The poet, of course, has a natural preparation, for he creates a portal, a window on eternity. Each time he writes a poem, he opens the world to the ineffable, and he is continuously breathed upon. He praises the evening dove, and the dove is the symbol of Aphrodite, of love. And surely the evening dove is, of course, the evening star, which is Venus, the Romanized name of Aphrodite, who rests with all the stars in the sky. The poet sits by his window and writes song after song, praising his new life his human daughter in her cradle. And by being breathed upon, his ordinary life is imbued with an extra dimension and lived to its depth. His soul is the feminine expression of La Loba. He is in a prayer state created by songs and thus is singing praises. The poem is so closely aligned to a song with its rhythm and sound. I often found myself that when I learned poems by heart at school or a piece of Shakespeare, which was what happened uh, in my day at school, we learned things by heart, which of course is significantly different from learning by rote. So if I want to remember a piece of Shakespeare or one of those poems, I first of all remember the rhythm. It always happens that way. And then when the rhythm is moving within me, the words begin to lie over the rhythm, to rest on it. So song itself is creative word and is a special kind of rhythmic language. Now, that language which is unordinary, calls the gods in a different way than the spoken prose word can. But still, one can sing the spoken word if the inner heart response to rhythm is present. Sound enriched with the voice and the music of nature, the wind, the sound of water is numinous. In Jung's um, book, Symbols of Transformation, he describes how form is brought into being by sound. The ear was not first created and then could hear. Sound, vibration itself, created the ear and brought the form into being. So when we sing over the bones like Laloba sang over the wolf bones, he brings things into being. The fur, the breath, the tail, the whole body everything. So we have to learn to sing. It creates whole new worlds for us. And don't be too literal about singing. There's something that sings in the soul. Before I trained as a Jungian analyst, I was a singer. And I remember my first small part which was to sing the role of one of the angels in Haydn's oratorio, The Creation. I stood up to sing this most over-rehearsed and very tiny part, 
And as my voice began to sing, I became aware that I was being surrounded by a transparent bubble that enclosed and protected me. I think that I sang this into being. And the bubble continued with me, allowing me to concentrate until I had finished singing. And then the bubble dissolved. I know that singing takes us into a different world. For it even appeared in such an extroverted situation on a stage with hundreds of people watching. So when Pinkola Este says, sing, sing, I know she's speaking the truth. In mythological terms, the world is sung into being and could be our first instinctive rising. For a rising is birth giving and birth giving is creation and creation has a feminine sound to it. In fact, I think that this was the way my mother strengthened the instinct in us by the vibration of her voice that had a singing quality to it. Our favourite stories were ghost stories because they gave us a freeze on and they frightened us in a safe situation. So the fear was more of a, a thrill than a real fear. We were safe. Also with her singular character, who could never ask for a story. She just pretended she hadn't heard. We knew it was time when she started to settle and pull herself inward. You know, when a dog goes to its basket, it doesn't go straight down, it, it circles, and then bang, it's in. So at that point, she would pull herself inward and a strange atmosphere would grow out from her. And then we would gather round whilst pretending not to, if that was the game. So, besides the ghost stories, she told us local sagas of unsolved murders and strange secrets and happenings in the community. But she never, never named anyone. She inspired us without ever telling us. She inspired in us a nose for smelling a rat, how to protect ourselves if we got in a spot. In short, there was no cultivation of false, naive trust. Our instincts were educated. As we lived in a remote place, strange things had to be handled. I think this worked. I remember walking towards a particular hooded, uh, particular wooded hill. I liked this place a lot. And without looking where I was going, I suddenly stopped, lifted up my head. And in the trees, I could see a man waiting. I didn't wait to think. In a split second, I turned around and ran. And to this day, I can remember running down the road, made of gravel, and hearing the small stones jump and rattle as I almost flew over them. Such speedy reactions are based on instinct. This, then, is the correct form of life-saving fear, rather than the neurotic fear that many psychologists will give you a good description of it. So, when you meet La Loba in a strange place and you're frightened, as you need to be, remember it may protect you. We can see from this that stories are medicine. The atmosphere of my experience there matched the atmosphere of one of my mother's fear-inducing stories and acted as apotropaic medicine and that is a sort of medicine that is intended to ward off harmful influences. Now this is very contra to how some fairy tales are told these days 
when the dark and nasty bits are cleaned out so as not to frighten the children. The instinctive relationship to them is then lost and the rational lighter side is superimposed. But fear of the right kind, especially encapsulated in a fairy tale, is a lifesaver. And yet, like meat in Pinkola Estes' book, it's only in later years that I've learned to appreciate my mother's wisdom and in retrospect, learned how it protected me. I am certain from what I know of her history, for she had many secrets, some of which I later found, and they have become my story. She had, I think, the hidden wolf tail under her skirt. Her season was winter. She told the stories when the days were short and people stayed inside for long hours and gazed at the caverns in the fire. The hay wagons were finished for the year. We could no longer ride on them. The days were short. Now the telling of stories is the pivot of Clarissa Pinkola Estes work and this is what she says of them and I quote Whenever a fairy tale is told, it becomes night. No matter where the dwelling, no matter the time, no matter the season, the telling of tales causes a starry sky and a white moon to creep over the eaves and hover over the heads of the listeners. Sometimes by the end of the tale, the chamber is filled with daybreak. Other times, a star shant is left behind. Sometimes a ragged thread of storm sky. And whatever is left behind is the bounty to work with, to use toward the soul making. So, I hope you will go out and let stories that is life happen to you and that you will work with these stories from your life, your life, not someone else's life. Water them with your blood and tears and your laughter till they bloom, till you yourself burst into bloom. That is the work the only work. That's the end of what Pinkola Estes says. So next time, we will look at the obstacles to that work. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. You are a great storyteller. Please come and sit next to my bread and read stories for me. <laughs> uh, I really loved so many things you said, especially the one I wrote down, that there is something that sings in the song. Wow. Yeah. Well, I just have two quick questions uh, so that we can turn to our audience. Both of these uh, are in the Vasalisa story if I pronounce the, uh, her name right. Uh, so, um, okay, let me just quote her uh, lines and then I ask the question. She says, woman's intuition that knowing being who walks wherever women walk, looking at all things in their lives and commenting on the truth of it all with swift accuracy is reset into woman's psyche. The goal is a loving and trusting relationship with this being whom we have to come to call the knowing woman, the essence of the wild woman archetype. She also says that the, what intuition is for, it's a direct messenger of the soul. So my, could you please clarify for me the relatedness or the distinction 
between the soul, this wild woman archetype, and the self with the double, with the double, <laughs> the capital S, that is that objective wisdom. So how are these related? Yes. Um, you have, um, the self is of course non-gendered. Mm -hmm. It's the supreme experience. Uh, you could call it Ezekiel's wheel. And it's the cosmic center of us all. It's most of the time way beyond us. But we can find a relationship with this through intuition, which takes a few of the doors away. Because intuition is a direct line to the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And so most of our lives, because we've become so rational, we've denigrated intuition a bit and relegated it uh, to corners that it shouldn't be in. So the self is the cosmic center of us all. We're not just a body. When I was a child, I used to try and find the back of my mind. I thought it must end. But I could never find the back of my mind. So I had to come to the conclusion that whatever I felt inward was an internal universe like the one that we are present to explore physically. So we're made like that. So the cosmic center of us all is within us and without us. And we use intuition to find um, a thread or a line towards it and to be nourished by it. Mm. And it comes unbidden. We cannot control it. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's La Loba. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just that she's been made into a story to help us to grasp it. Okay, so in a wild woman archetype, how is this archetype is related to, to the self or to the soul? Well, the archetype, you, you probably need to make a distinguish, to distinguish between the archetypal image, which is what manifests before us, which is mm -hmm. in a story, La Loba, mm -hmm. and what that archetypal image represents. Okay. So no one has ever seen an archetype. Oh. In the Bible, they would say no one has ever looked on the face of God and lived. So in order to protect us from the archetypal power, which is greater than the atom bomb exploding in front of us, we have an archetypal image, but one must never confuse the two. So the self is not an archetypal image. It's mm. the center or the energetic aspect of cosmic energy. It's ineffable. So when you talk about wild woman, you're talking about an archetypal image. So those paintings you saw were archetypal images. They were not archetypes. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that Thank make you. sense to you? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, that's, yeah, because I was a bit confused when, when in a book it was talked about the wild woman and the wild woman archetype. And then I'm like, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, the wild woman archetype is the image. Of the wild woman. Yeah. yeah. But behind the image. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The other is, it's interesting, you know, in the same tale, and this is about the, the aspect of the doll. So this is what she says. The doll is the symbolic little life. It is the symbol of what lies buried in humans that is numinous. It is a small and glowing facsimile of the original self. Superficially, it is just a doll. But inversely, it represents a little piece of soul that carries all the knowledge of the larger soul self. In a doll is the voice, the old Lacusabe, the one who knows, probably didn't say it right, sorry. The doll is related to the symbol of the leprechaun, elf, pixie, fairy, and the dwarf. A fairy, in the fairy tales, these represent a deep throb of wisdom within the culture of the psyche. So, so girls, little girls, they get dolls and boys get 
cars or guns or whatever. I never thought when I was a little, I had my favorite doll, that why, I, did, I never thought that that was part of my, myself, really. And um, uh, it really makes sense. But what my question is maybe a little bit silly question, but I have some friends my age or older, and they still sleep with their doors and little fluffy things they are in their bed. All these actually represent the same thing as the doors represented to us when we were little. In a way, but in a way not. I mean, the doll of Vasilisa, her mother gave her the doll. Yeah. And so we could say that this was, um, uh, the word is apotropaic medicine. Mm -hmm. That is, whenever she needs help, she just puts a hand on the doll in the pocket and it does things for her. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a medicine way. Mm -hmm. It's like a kind of totem. And it allows her the, a relationship with what the images are in the story. She has to find a relationship with Baba Yaga, mm -hmm. who is the witch. She can only do it if she can have an intermediary, which is the doll. So this is a kind of, apo that's that word, apotropaic medicine. Mm -hmm. So no one can approach these archetypal images directly. They have to go through a medium. And so that's what the story's about. Mm -hmm. And then we come to people hanging on to their dolls. Then the reasons are legion. Mm. There is not one reason. You can't rationalize it into one thing. Each person will have a different relationship with their doll. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Well, we have uh, two people from our audience put their hand up. Suzanne Hodgins. Oh, actually, no, we have more. Excellent. Suzanne, Rick, could you bring on Susan, please, and open her video and audio? What's the last name again? Hodgins, H-O-D-H-I-N-S. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is she raised her hand? Oh, there she is. I got her. Okay. Thanks. She should be there. Ah, uh, I can see a sunset. Her, yes. Her she... mic is off. Hold on. Uh, I don't know. I'm asking her to unmute. Um, Susan, maybe you can unmute yourself. That would be easier. Why don't you try somebody else and we'll see if Suzanne can. Okay, then we have Yasmin Berkiran. Okay, Yasmin's there. Okay. Is it possible to open uh, Yasmin's audio and video, please? Working on it. Um, Hello, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 hi, I'm sorry. I raised my hand by mistake. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is that a mistake? Is that a mistake? <laughs> I just touched the screen. <laughs> That's all right. There is no pressure if you don't want to talk. That's totally fine. So uh, we can't open Susan's... Um... No, she... Um, <clears throat> we'll try again here and see. Okay, um, well, let, let's uh, go with uh, Angie Azul. Sure. Please. Okay, she's open. Hello. Hi, Angie. Hi. Um, so I had a, a thought about, um, Brenda, when you were talking about the wolf comes to you we don't chase the wolf. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any rituals or uh, more 3D rituals that can start to open that um, invitation so the wolf comes? And, and not the psychedelic drugs, not the, you know, like 
blast you out, but something that starts to speak to the universe or starts to speak to that inner wolf that maybe you're curious, maybe you're ready. Are there any things out there that can help? I would say that the best thing of all is a very deep reflection on your life. And that when that starts to happen, that the wolf woman hears it. And then she will approach. Thank you. Does it answer your question, Angie? It does. Um, I think that I've had this, well, I know I have like two and a half years ago, I had a dream that I was a wolf and I was standing in the middle of a yard on a stone looking at the moon with these redwoods. I live in that place now. I found it. And I felt a connection there, but I haven't had wolf dreams since then. So I'm just curious that I followed that, followed my intuition and found this lovely place that has been such a healing spot for me and my family. Um, but I haven't seen her since. So I was just curious. Yes. Well, obviously the psyche thought that one wolf dream was enough <laughs> because you, you got the message. Yeah, I did. I did. And yeah, and you, you reflected on it and acted on it. We did. And, it's and so La Loba doesn't come all at once. <laughs> she comes mm -hmm. in little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. First one experience, then the other, and the door opens slowly. Hmm. It was and interesting. It does the least harm. <laughs> when uh, the realtor brought me to this place, I was looking at it for myself, and I we drove up the the uh, driveway and I got out and I said, this is it. And he goes, do you want to see the house? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no, I want to see the land. <laughs> the land called me here <laughs> and it's been amazing. But yeah, I wasn't sure if I had done something to kind of shut it down since I listened and then I haven't got anything new or if I'm just waiting to hear again or be open again. No, it'll just come. <laughs> it'll just come. We, we, we live in a world where we think we've always done the wrong thing, but we never do the wrong thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We just do what we do at the time. True. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Andrew. You. Thank you, Brenda. Now let's hear from Anne-Marie Terry. Rick, if you could... Uh... She's open. Wonderful. Okay, I've just unmuted. Can you hear you're... me? Yeah, yes, you're sir. unmuted. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Brenda, for your wonderful presentation. I really thank enjoyed you. it. Um, made me very um, inspired. So today I started, I, I owned this book some years ago um, while I was training to be a psychotherapist and it stayed on my shelf and I think I lent it to a client and never got it back. And it just oh, I've done millions of the book like that. I've yeah. got innumerable copies and lent them and never <laughs> seen them again. Mm. I know. So I never read it. And then so today I, I downloaded it. I'm playing catch up at the moment with everything. I downloaded it on audio. I started to listen. It's the truncated version. But nevertheless, I heard the story about the wolf that you've now just repeated. And I came a light in my garden. I thought, oh, my God, it's a dream I had in 2013. I, I know that because I was doing a dreams course and the dream was so weird and I couldn't really explain it to Nigel, who was guiding us. Um, so I thought, I'll write a quick poem. And I, th I know I write these poems and I lose them. Anyway, I've spent hours looking for it and I found it. God knows I found it. I was like a mad woman. So I just like to share it because it sort of sums up a bit. So it's called, it was a dream and it's called A Bone From My Crone. So it says, dreaming down to the bone that enchanted night, calling forth calcified connections and dinosaur dynasties, the genesis of my skeletal self. She handed it to me smiling, her leathery face a map of her wanderings, her eyes burning deep into my soul like a laser, accepting it graciously and caressing its smooth white surface with closed eyes, I chewed upon its meaning. Then, holding it above my head like a prayer flag, 
I began howling like a wolf. It is that, she said. Carve it from your breath, then shape it with your sound. Only then will you be standing in the middle of your own prayer. Mm. So reading, reading the, 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 the story today, it kind of brought that part of my life uh, alive again. It was, it was wonderful. It's a lovely poem. Yeah, it, it's, it was, it's an opening poem, isn't it? It's a, an opening poem. I think so, yes. Hmm. I think so. It was a strange dream, very powerful. Um, hmm. I, need to, I need to sit with it for a bit because I, sometimes I write them and I put it away and I forget about it. So I think I need to, it's, it's inspired me to think on this poem a bit more. Hmm. Lanova comes when you sit and think a bit. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll go back to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much for sharing. Thank you. Uh, Eric, will you please open Katie Viner's settings? Uh, she's open. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Georgie. Hi. Uh, thank you Hello. so much for today. I, um, I actually haven't begun. I actually uh, decided I wanted to listen to uh, Clarissa's audio on um, warming the stone child, uh, those stories about the motherless child. And um, I've been processing those and ready to sink my teeth into women who run with the wolves um, here shortly. And I very much connect with the storytelling style of her writing and of of your talk today mm -hmm. i feel that that really stirs and inspires truth and um just the deeper the, the deeper layers inside of of me of us and uh creating meaning and understanding life and um growing as humans and um Particularly in the stories you shared today, I, I connected with, was it La Loba? Is that her name? La Loba, the wolf. La Loba, the wolf woman. And the way, the, all of the concepts, just so much metaphor and that story, so much meaning to pull from all of the elements and mm. the it's way that It's a really she, beautiful story. Mm. It is, and it's it's just so true. There's so much truth in the idea that our growth comes from these dark, dark times. These these um, moments or experiences of despair or death. And it, reflecting on my life, I see where some of my darkest moments burst my biggest growths and my biggest strengths and so the the idea of the wolf which is you know such a powerful you know apex animal um both in its death it, both in its sort of desolate form and also in its most lively form um and sort of bringing that together with the embodiment of the feminine um i it it just it just feels so true and so so inspiring to me um that's basically all that i i feel moved to say today just that i feel stirred and i feel um i feel excited and connected to you and and everyone here from the talk today so thank you thank you Thank you so much, Katie. Now let's hear from Michelle Blair. She's open. Thank you. Hello, Brenda. Hello, Georgie. Hello, dear. Oh, thank Michelle. you so much. Wonderful lecture. Um, oh, gosh, the, the part on moral obligation. I had to read that a few times because in the book it says to live out and to express what one has learned in the descent or ascent to the wild self. 
And it made me realize that my first reaction to moral obligation is, of course, one that would become from a Christian version. And that, that version is what had led me to more of a life like Bluebeard mm. um, that caused for me to stay in, to cut off my instincts because I was being morally right or what I thought. But going through a more of a descent or initiation of that process, is what is necessary for me to see moral obligation as to my whole self and not to this this other version that I guess I held in my own mind. It's easy to mistake the word moral. Yes. It's a (laughs) very conventional meaning. But what Jung means by a moral obligation is to follow the truth of yourself, which will go against the conventional moral so don't make mix up the two well i had experience a few weeks ago um in my shower and all of a sudden i had this voice that just kept saying michelle michelle and just repeating my name and then finally i felt moved to start saying my name as if i was trying to breathe myself back into me as I'm mm-hmm. going still through a process. And I thought it was the strangest thing how I felt awkward actually mm-hmm. saying my name to myself. And then I realized it was just my conditioning. But maybe possibly that was Los Lobos saying to me, know yourself. It's okay to be Michelle. That, that. Mm-hmm. And I that, that it was a very spontaneous, what would seem random and ridiculous event, but really... It wasn't. I guess it was her speaking through all the oddest ways <laughs> we suspected. Yes, you know, um, the experience of hearing your own name uh, is quite a profound one and it needs to be given attention. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's important to reflect on it. It's very important because our name is not an accident. We may think it's something our mother likes or or something, but it's a little bit more than that. And to hear your name called uh, uh, vocally is uh, an experience. And there is a moral obligation to find the truth of what that means. That's what the moral obligation is. It's nothing to do with um, uh, evangelical Christianity which is where it's usually applied or Protestant theology or all that stuff. Yeah. It's not that. The moral obligation is finding the energy to follow the truth of yourself, even if it means running naked in the desert and howling at the moon. There you fulfill your moral obligation if that is what you're meant to do. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, now let's turn to Rachel Root. Rachel, <coughs> Rachel's open. Thank you. Although she's muted. Okay, no, now she... can you hear me? Yes, oh, we can. Thank you. Brenda, yay. I sat next to you a year ago at Shark and got to meet you. So thank you so much. It's lovely to hear you and see you. I have three questions. I'll keep them rather brief. The first is you talked about Ezekiel's wheel and you talked about the symbolic vision of the universe. And then you said Jung would have called it ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. And I didn't get that. Which bit was that now? That was, you were talking about that... uh, I, I put down something like umbala or something. Does that make sense? When you were talking about Ezekiel's wheel. Oh, yes, Ezekiel's wheel. I found all of that really fascinating with Ezekiel's wheel. The um, New Testament is full of archetypal images which have been drowned by the wrong kind of morality. <laughs> Uh, I've got it here somewhere. It's quite near the beginning, I think. Oh, here we are. Uh, 
Now, I've got the bit with Ezekiel's wheel. What was the bit that you missed? You said that it was symbolic vision. Oh, it was, uh, uh, we can imagine four wheels spinning with each, within each other, a great symbolic vision. Jung would have called that a mandala, a vision of the self in paradise. Oh. Okay, that's it. A mandala. A mandala. M-A-N-D-A-L-Y, which Lovely. is always a circular form and is often spinning. And right. it's been used in, in many, uh, all religions I've seen a mandala. And it's, it's really the energy of the universe. Fantastic. Thank you. And you talked about the ascent to the wild self. Is that like what Wilbur talks about, the ascent, ascent and descent? Or is that, can you explain that? What, the ascent and the descent? Yeah, the ascent to the wild self. What does that mean? It depends where you're standing as to what ascent and descent means. So if you're in bed like the rabbi and suddenly the angel comes and takes you to the seventh heaven, then you're into an ascent. Because uh, the conception mm -hmm. of the rabbi would be that heaven is upwards. Okay. So when we come to the vision of Ezekiel, this is in fact a vision of the self and the self is a psychological word for uh, a symbol of God. The self is a capital S, is the same uh, word as God. It's just that it's been put into a psychological form. Okay. Like for instance, if we take the cross, we can either call it a symbol of Christ or we can say it's a symbol of the ascent and descent that you're talking about and the cross that goes across is the symbol of the horizontal is our earthly life so the cross is where the earthly life and the heavenly life intersect and that we would say is a symbol of life not necessarily christian but it can right. also be christian that's fantastic thank you i just I got lost there. I understand that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, one last thing. You, you said, and I loved this, you said that instincts are, um, are educated. Can you explain that? <laughs> well, if you're very young and you don't understand rational things, if you live in a place where I used to live, you get educated instinctually and not intellectually. So the thing that protect, protects you is if you've heard a story to, uh, being told and you're frightened in the story, then you take that into your soul and that acts as an instinctive guide because you've touched the fear, which is an instinctive mm. emotion. So when, then when you go out into the world, and suddenly you meet someone um, and you suddenly feel frightened and the feeling of the story comes back. You get something like what my mother used to call the gypsy's warning or um, be a bit circumspect there. Perhaps you shouldn't go there. Mm. This is the instinct. It's an entirely animal-like way of protecting yourself. Mm. You find the opposite of this with certain young people who I've met in therapy, for instance, I once met one young girl and she said, I can wear what I like and walk home at what time of the night I like. That's my choice. Well, it was her choice and the inevitable happened because she, she'd lost her instinct because rationality had forced it down. And so she got into trouble. Mm. So we need the instinct to keep us alive. Mm -hmm. you, you do meet people who have suffered a lot and we say they have a survival instinct. Yes. 
they're still alive, even after they've been almost beaten to death, you know, they still live, they still begin again, they still have a life. Mm. This mm. is instinct. Mm. And then when we're older, we, we get uh, an intellectual or other education. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. <laughs> yes, Thank lovely you. questions. Thank you. I hope we yes. sit next to each other again. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be lovely. <laughs> Yes, uh, there's one more question from Angie, uh, but maybe uh, you can discuss that uh, directly. She would like to take some Jung classes. Uh, I don't know if you can recommend any, any to her. She's in the States, uh, but maybe we can talk about this kind of like hmm. offline. If you send me an email, I'll, I'll um, recommend something. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much, Brenda. Well, thank you so much for today. Thank you for, for attendees. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next time in October, we will meet an hour earlier. Uh, please make sure that uh, you will get a reminder anyway, but just in case it lands in your spam folder, we start an hour earlier, i.e. 19 CET, which is noon ET, and 10 a.m. Pacific time. <clears throat> Thank you everybody again and uh, stay well and safe and uh, look forward to seeing you all uh, in a month's time. All the very best. Thank you Thank again, you Brenda. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.